Yeah, it's just going back and forth. It's back up to 11 now. I know, it just, it just like goes against my, <laughs> like it just, like, for whatever reason, just want to see green, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, it's almost like a reminder too. It's like, even though it just reminds you to be, you got to kind of be aggressive a bit with it, but also you're working on something that's delicate. <laughs> totally, yeah. And I'm sure Video Steve's beat on his cameras with giant hammers all the time, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Feels right to do that, doesn't it? <laughs> uh, he was he was definitely part of the group that uh, oh, yeah. I was, was, I was hanging off of it with, like, multiple strap wrenches and stuff. I saw Jake bend the uh, pry bar. Yeah. <laughs> yeah the Have big cast iron pry bars. Good photo from the machine shop, actually, you should see. I saw, I saw the one with the motion blur. Yeah, the motion, yeah. like, smashy. Yeah. <laughs> it's amazing. I was like convinced it was just a reverse thread and we were just tightening it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because it was so ridiculously tight. It's like no excuse. It's crazy. It's so I'm, I'm, I was surprised to see you put tape on the dome because isn't the dome like optical glass? Yes. Yeah. It, yeah. That's pretty. I guess I never checked up on like. I would never put tape on my lens. That yeah. Seems. Interesting. Yeah. I feel like I've done that. I've done that since the beginning, and that might be one of those things that like somebody told me to do in my first year in grad school, and I've been doing it ever since. Mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering if like, do your lenses have coating on them that you can't clean with alcohol? No, we clean them with alcohol. Okay. Um, I mean, ideally, yeah. Ideally, I try to clean them with air, and then if that doesn't work, I okay. use uh, alcohol wipe. Yeah, um, it the e tape like protects them really well, and I think some of those lenses just are up against a little bit crummier treatment than like what you might treat your like red camera with. They just get abused more. You're saying you're like the, when the dome. we our like our viewports. Yeah. Um, and they're also not um, they're also viewports instead of being lenses. But are they not optically? Like yes, they're optically, optically perfect. Corrected. Yeah. They have to be corrected for yes, which water. makes them but to me like, the what's corrections. The between that and the lens at that point, but the corrections are on the inside. I would agree. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah the op the optical corrections are so on the inside. Yeah, I see. I because there's layers to the dome. It's not just like one uh -huh. piece of glass. Okay. Yeah, it's like it's like a lens that doesn't change anything basically, especially a hemispherical lens. Um, it seems to protect them pretty well from like the abuse of like. Being in, a, in the it, RV shop. Yeah, and yeah. like heavy, they're, you know, we operate them with heavy equipment and yeah. it's not always clean or nice. And um, we have a polishing system that we use sometimes, which. Because you have to clean residue off when you take the tape off? Sometimes they get like hard water like marks on them over time. Mm. And you have to like polish clean. them. Yeah, you, you can't just wipe okay. it off. Okay, so that changes things like thinking of that you could actually like polish it down. Yeah, it's something away. the manufacturer, we've had like so many discussions and he won't. He'll be like, well, I don't recommend polishing it, but you could try this thing here. Like, he won't, he won't cross that line. But we've polished it. We polish them, the hard watermarks and then other little smudges out, like before, and it comes out actually quite quite good. Kay. Yeah, I don't. I have never found any drawbacks to putting e-tape on them and certainly advantages, like, when they're just... Because they're usually, like, bashing around in, like, a lab or a shop, like... You yeah, I know, just think, like, is there not a cap? We have the bucket, right? We but have the bucket. That's our yeah, only cap yeah. we have. Yeah, they don't come with. But them. like, that when seems like a better option to me. But I guess it's yeah. not always. Yeah, definitely, it's just not always feasible. Yeah, the, a lot of these cameras are like, there's not a lot of them, or like they're one offs, or they're yeah, like yeah. six offs, or. Would the cap of the mini Zeus have gone over that 
well, yeah, it would have worked. Right, it wouldn't have worked, right. Have worked, right. Like, you know, yeah. I don't know. I think it's a practical thing, and there don't seem to be that many drawbacks. I don't know. Why would, what what makes you feel icky about that? Uh, just because I wouldn't ever want to put, like, t glue on glue. my lens. Yeah. Okay. Um, Which makes perfect sense. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. I but never, I have never even given it a second thought, which is really funny. Well, when you say that's one of the, that's what I think I yeah. thought of it because when you said it makes me like I saw that and I was like, oh, yeah, yeah. that's Electrical funny. Electrical tape completely covering a yeah. piece of optical glass. I, yeah, I was surprised. But Josh, where do you come down on that? You'd rather cover it or not cover it? Uh, well, I think in that particular case, again, it was a reminder because we knew we weren't going to use that piece of glass again. So it was almost just like a. Like a like a reminder that we're we need to be a little bit careful with this yeah, thing, and especially taking to the machine shop. It was mostly to tell, like to kind of show the machine shop guys like we want to be careful with this. E yeah, even yeah. if it wasn't, if that was a brand new, I that would, was a perfect piece of glass. I see why you want to protect it because we yeah. were literally swinging the hammer and yeah, yeah. And know. we curse every little scratch. Like if there's a scratch on there, like we're like mar, 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 all the time. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I guess a scratch is worse than. Uh, yeah, and so like and then can, glue. Glue you can get off. We can get yeah. the glue off. It's pretty off. hardy. Yeah. yeah. That's kind yeah. of that's kind of my point. Like. Yeah. No, I. I I've and I've it. been doing it since year one of grad school, and I never questioned it because it just seemed to work and didn't have any drawbacks. But like, now that you put it that way, I'm kind of like, oh yeah, if I if I was carrying a camera, I would never put lens. I would never even put a tape on the filter. Right. That would be weird. I think uh, I think it's a little more forgiving on these cameras because you never have light when you're doing what you want to do. You don't usually have light shining at the lens. Oh, interesting. Like if you have any type of dust on your lens or scratch on your lens, it's going to be most obvious when you're you're looking at sunlight, basically. Or oh, that's super interesting. Any type of light source. That's a really good point. And the biggest light source we get in Hercules is usually like a sponge reflecting back at it. Yeah. On occasion, you'll. Like Get the Argus, Argus lights yeah. shining behind. Yeah. That's, that's about. We got Delta Dan. <laughs> yeah, Delta Dan. Don't even tell. <laughs> I hadn't. I hadn't told him that nickname. <laughs> that's how you get the great shots, though. I mean. Yeah, and he yeah. got beautiful shots. They you were get, amazing. Dan always says, "This is what Bob pays me for." These yeah, exactly. It is. I mean, totally. We had the we had the Argus Zeus at the time, and we were just getting like beautiful oh, stuff. Yeah. It was yeah. amazing. Yeah. Yeah, best shots. You got to put Argus in a little bit of. Tenuous situations. But. Oh, look, our starboard box is closed. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing sticking uh, out. Did we get that? Did we end up getting that sample to the lab? Oh, that yeah. Intact, yeah? Yeah. Cool. Well, it, in, in a couple pieces, but yeah. But everything. the bit didn't break off during recovery? No, it's, it was pretty rigid stuff. Cool. Heavy duty. How did the samples look getting off the ship or off Hercules? All of them made it. Um, yeah, no, no major issues. Uh, well, okay, we shouldn't say all of them made it. The C pen that was slurped up at the very end of the last uh, dive was um, eventually fell out of the slurp tube. It didn't get all the way this through. This is this is what you but were warning me about C pens. Like we just had like a yeah. whole chat over lunch about like what you shouldn't slurp, and he's like, no. C pens. Yeah. Do not slurp C pens. They're terrible. They are. Th They're unslurpable. They so look slurpable and they are unslurpable. <laughs> there's there's like a, a size threshold and I can't tell you exactly what that is. Um, Trade but secret. Yeah. <laughs> so if if it Job if it can security. go through the slurp without bending, it have to go around. Uh, so if it's you know somewhat flexible, uh, or if it acts like a um, a, a single rigid you know, mm -hmm. pellet or piece, it goes through fine. Um, we did that once uh, on this expedition, once on the last cruise too. Um, but if if the second it has to flex around something, they have a fairly rigid um, sp uh, spine to them. Uh, not like backbone spine, but like the stiffer part of the um, colony. And that ha acts like a spring. And if it goes around something, it tends to just get stuck. Uh, and the one they had sampled via slurp was very long. Um, and so I have a feeling it didn't flex enough. 
uh, it was pretty rigid in the tube. And so it eventually worked itself out um, and then fell off just as they were bringing her out of the water. Oh, bummer. Oh, no. It made it that far. Yeah. That's a bummer. You, you warned us. We knew it was coming. Yeah, happens. There's, it's a builds on a lot of hard feelings. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you have had some angst over sea pen sampling, haven't you? Yeah, they they're they're challenging, and you really do need the whole thing. You can't just take a snip off the top. Um, yeah, they're okay. not. It's not really informative. Um, kind of like taking the tail of the fish. Oh, interesting. You, know? you don't get the whole thing. Actually, Roger. did you get to see your crinoid? <laughs> yeah, I did, and it was everything I could have ever imagined. Oh, good. Yes. <laughs> it's a very fulfilling moment. Oh, that's <laughs> awesome. Got very excited about your rocks today. Yeah, you finally let me handle the rocks. That was, <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that was uh, science manager and training Bremer, not yeah. me. I was, I was uh, well, Sarah call. has faith in me, so it was a big step. <laughs> she kind of walked like me through it. I we're so mean. I can't, can't even touch the rocks. <laughs> even Kraft gets to touch the rocks. <laughs> Ashley, what, do you, what did you do with them? Yeah, Sarah walked me through a lot of the description uh, stuff so that we could make sure that we got uh, accurate descriptions and kind of characterize them based on what kind of uh, geologic processes we're seeing. So it was very cool. Did you do any squats? <laughs> I tried, but then I stumbled and almost fell, so I decided not to. Yeah, that was me in the gym last <laughs> night. I tried to do squats. It was a horrible idea. Yep. <laughs> Yeah, well, we're, we're going to need some uh, hands when we repack the pallet with all probably 1,300 pounds of rocks. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Every, anyone and everyone is welcome to join. I'll help move rocks. Since we don't have to take on stores, we have to do something mandatory. Oh, we have two knives. Will you provide refreshments? We have the one in Dan's holster <laughs> and the one above the uh, mm. the rack for the Niskins. Had someone curious about the sponge we brought up. Um, was it all crust on top of it, or what did it actually look like when we brought you it? You know, up? Um, it it was crusty in parts, um, but the the center was not was pretty well preserved. You know, normal sponge spicule texture and color. Um, you know, I I don't really have a good explanation for it. Um, I think we'll take a look. Uh, send some off to some crust experts to give their two cents. Um, hopefully they'll be able to tell us more about kind of how long it's been there, uh, what the composition might be. It's not particularly thick. It's probably on the order of a millimeter or less. Yeah. But that's still a million years-ish, maybe? Maybe. <laughs> well, so th there are there are live specimens of this coral present in this area, or uh, of this sponge, rather. So we know that it exists here, but it might just have not, um, might not be you know, common or even present at this uh, previous site anymore. Um, it's almost identical to one from the musician, musician's seamounts. Uh, it's also very similar to ones we saw on the previous expedition, which is not far away. It's only a couple hundred miles or so. But you know we, we have uh, we've seen evidence of uh, iron manganese covered you know, biogenic uh, skeletons in other parts of the ocean too. Um, actually, I might have some photos of them. My 
be worthwhile to look at. We have a minute. You've got lots of minutes. The lock valves get sticky, so I don't know if you notice if I was shouldering down, it would then I'd stop and it would still go, it would still creep. So it needs exer they need it needs exercise. So now if I did that, worked it back and forth a bunch, and so now it'll stop. So lock valves. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, did you? Uh, did you do that? Yeah, it's because we don't use it. we don't use it enough. So, so I was just doing both because those are the two that are tend to do that the most. It's just because it doesn't get used very much. Because we put, we replaced all the lock valves in June. Yeah, so the whole thing. So it's so it's not the valves. It's just that they just don't get used and they get sticky. That's so now, let's see, it's a little snappier when it stops. It, it, before it'll just creep, but now, like, boom, stops. So now, now, the, now the lock valve is engaging. Abby and Josh, I have a lot of ROV questions coming in. You've got some time? Yep. Yeah, yeah, that's Do awesome. It. I feel I, like we haven't been getting a lot no, lately. No, no, I know. Some. Well, people have been so invested in us getting rocks and things. So yeah. now, now's a great time for all these questions. Yeah, bring it. Okay. So maybe a follow-up to earlier explaining um, how we lower the ROVs in, but when we're bringing them back to the ship, yeah. how does Hercules reconnect to the duck crane? Yeah, sorry. I should have gone to the next step there. Yeah, so... We actually, uh, there's a, what we call a lift line. So there's another soft plasma line. And if you look closely, you'll see it, um, you know, like a loop double back on itself through that same lift bail. So that piece of line connects to the lift bail. And we don't use that at launch. We only use it at recovery. So that line goes, it's like 35 meters longish or whatever. And it goes along the yellow uh, tether that connects to Argus. And we marry that together with what we call a daisy chain. So you're doing like a chain braid knot all the way along. And it just, it just ties the two lines together. Like basically the marries the lift line to that tether. And we take it all the way back to Argus and we secure it at Argus. So that when we come back to the surface, uh, you'll see when we're in the right position, we'll bring her up behind the ship or bring Argus onto the deck. And then you'll see deck chief Mark or whoever's running the deck will disc like untie that lift line and we'll pull someone will pull off the daisy chain and then you hand that lift line which is now freed and connected to Herc to the crane and you put that onto that um, the winch on the crane on its line and you just do a little bowl in there and then you just winch in and so now you've got Herc onto the winch of the crane and you, you literally winch him in and lift them out of the water. Great description. And sometimes you can catch it, or you, if you're on and stay after blue water when we're ascending, you can see all that happening. It's pretty fun to watch. Um, that goes I, up I watch it a lot. Side. That's like, when I watch, that's usually you know, what I'm chiming in for the launches and recoveries. It's uh, it's some of the most challenging part of, of ROV work. You know, you have to develop your systems and it's vessel dependent and system dependent. And uh, it's kind of the riskiest part is like what we call getting through the interface, getting through that uh, swell interface down to where it's nice and calm under the water. But it can be quite violent in that, uh, that interface, that swell interface and waves and stuff. So you have to build your systems to withstand all of that. Yeah, it's pretty incredible. How much do each of the ROVs weigh? Uh, in air, uh, Argus weighs about 33 to 30. 3,500 pounds, and Hercules weighs roughly, depending what we have on it, around 5,500 to 5,800 pounds. Uh, in water, 
Argus weighs about 3,000 pounds, and Hercules is positively buoyant by roughly 40 to 50 pounds. Do you want to explain how that happens? How does Hercules become positively buoyant? So the yellow part, all that big yellow part on top, is syntactic foam, and it's it's uh, what floats Herc. So it can float all of the parts of Herc and then some. Um, we have about, uh, and that's where you get your payload. So we say Herc has about 250 pounds roughly of payload. So that means the foam can float everything on the ROV plus, you know, about 200 pounds of other things. So if a scientist wants to come with, you know, uh, some things they want to integrate into the ROV, they have, uh, electronics bottles or other heavy things, you can load those onto the RV and then we literally remove lead from Herc to compensate for that and to keep that buoyancy the same. We always wanted about 40 to 50 pounds and then that's why you see occasionally, like if we're collecting a lot of rocks, we're getting heavy, right? We're taking on weight onto the vehicle and so we have to let those uh, steel plates go and that puts us back to a buoyancy that we can actually float because we always want to be floaty. How much does that syntactic foam weigh in air? Oh, I'd have to look at the sheet. It's quite heavy. Get order they're, of magnitude. They're about 500 pounds a block, and there's four blocks on there. Right. So a considerable percentage yes. of Herc's weight is actually that foam block, which huh. then is buoyant in water. If it's like, if you think of it as being not buoyant in air, certainly isn't. Um, <laughs> it is buoyant in water. It is extremely buoyant in water, mm -hmm. but... On the other hand, it's also able to withstand uh, pressures up that you can see at 4,000 meters deep. So like if you had something that was like buoyant in water, like say a balloon, um, and you sunk it down to 4,000 meters, it would no longer be buoyant, it would just collapse, right? Because the balloon itself is not strong enough to um, stay buoyant, basically protect its uh, low density payload. Um, but the syntactic foam is really special because it can stay um, lower density, even as it withstands a ton of compression underwater. So that's like, it's heavy in air because it's really strong, but it's still buoyant in water. So it's a very special set of materials and it's, it's, you know, a pretty, it's very, it's very specialized for what we do for oceanography. And it, it does actually compress a little bit. So it'll shrink oh, yeah. a tiny bit when we're down there, but it's made up of little glass spheres that are uh, molded together in a, like an epoxy sort of mixture. Little glass spheres, you said? Little glass spheres, yeah, huh. tiny little glass spheres that are in a, they mold with a, like these special epoxies and things that hold all together. So you usually like buy these blocks. So you buy blocks of the foam and then you glue them all together and then uh, send them out to a shop. They get shaped into the shape that you want and, uh, and then covered with, the yellow is actually like a gel. So the foam's underneath the yellow part. That was a great description. Thank you. And many viewers, thank you for that awesome answer. Another question for you. When Herc is on deck, people have seen in some of our camera views hoses that are connected to Herc. What are those hoses for? Um, those hoses, okay, so Herc, um, a lot of functions on Herc are run by hydraulics. Um, and to run them subsea, we run a, um, a, high, um, a high pressure pump on board the vehicle. Um, and that high pressure pump generates, um, I'm actually not sure what the GPM on it is, but it can it can push like 3,000 PSI. Five, uh, at 5 GPM. 5.5? 5. 5. 5. Okay, yep. 5 GPM. Um, so when Herc is sub C, it creates all its own hydraulic pressure. Um, something like a tractor might do or you know a plow on the front of your truck or something it's got like a little hydraulic pump on it, it creates all its own local pressure when we get up on deck um, we don't want to run that pump it gets too hot um, the motor gets too hot the the systems are not set up to run that pump to run our hydraulic functions but when we're on deck we still want to be able to run our hydraulic functions we want to be able to test them we want to be able to open drawers so that the scientists can get their samples out um, we want to be able to fix things. Um, so we bypass the pump um, and run our own um, 
deck pump. So we don't use the pump on the vehicle. Instead, we use a separate uh, motor that runs a separate pump, and that sits in our shop. And so those hoses are hoses that run from the pump to the vehicle and run all of our hydraulics bypassing the high voltage motor and the onboard pump. We call it the auxiliary HPU. Uh, what is it? What HPU? Hydraulic, Hydraulic power unit. Power, yeah. Um, uh, so that we can run the vehicle on deck without stressing its components um, that we want to use when we run subsea. Um, so those are the hoses. So there's a supply hose, um, which is the hydraulic fluid traveling out, and a return hose, which is it flowing back. Um, and then there's a few others that we use for sort of safety and switching and things like that. Thank you, Gabby. That was amazing. So a couple people wondering, um, for maybe both you and Josh, how, like, what was your first exposure to work in ROVs? How did you get into this? When was the first time you learned about an ROV? Um, and then how did you become so expert in this? You want to explain a little bit of your career journeys to us? Yeah. Um, I came from a geography background, and I loved the idea of making maps. Um, and that's where I started, and I wanted to make maps. And so I applied to University of Rhode Island, and I got accepted into ocean engineering to make maps of the seafloor. And my soon-to-be advisor called me up the summer before I started and was like, hey, I got something I think you might want to do. Let's, let's get you out to the Black Sea for two weeks. You can hunt for shipwrecks with Dr. Ballard. And I was like, yeah, sign me up, quit my job. <laughs> Um, when it spent two weeks out in the Black Sea looking at these incredible 1,500-year-old um, shipwrecks like made of wood that were totally intact, like sitting on the bottom at like 150 meters or something, just like flying around them with the ROVs. And I started my, um, and I started my degree and I ended up doing a PhD learning and figuring out how to use ROVs to make the best possible like centimeter level three-dimensional maps of shipwrecks and hydrothermal vents and since I've left that field, it's come a long way, and you're seeing lots of really incredible photogrammetry done now um, of those sorts of things. It wasn't, it was a little harder back when I started. Um, and when I finished that, uh, like that first cruise was an ROV cruise with Hercules, and I was like, I want to fly ROVs. This is the greatest. So uh, when I finished that, I just started being in tech at in the ocean uh, like in oceanographic research and sort of found my way back and yeah that's my that's sort of my journey amazing josh has a very different one <laughs> like josh is too forestry yeah. very canadian <laughs> <laughs> i th i think what you'll you'll find is that uh, a lot of people get into the rov kind of well industry whether it's science or offshore in like a very different ways um it's kind of the common thread is we all come from different places which is what makes it fun and cool because you get to meet people from all different backgrounds uh, and because rvs are so multidisciplinary, uh, you get to meet lots of different people but mine's kind of weird um i actually my first introduction to rvs my background is actually i'm a i'm a marine biologist uh is what i went to school for hmm. and always forget that um and which is part of the reason why I love being out here because you get to mix everything together. But I was working in industry just as a contract, like uh, diving biologist. So I would dive and ID things and uh, work for different consultant companies and stuff like that. And I got, uh, this is sort of back in like late 90s, early 2000, I guess. And then the first introduction was back then to a consulting company who had just a little ROV. And I was part of uh, helping to develop uh, a way to survey beyond diveable depths for different types of industries in British Columbia because it hadn't really been done that well before, especially with small systems. And so I kind of got introduced to ROVs that way. And I was the person who sat, I was the Steve person. I mm. sat next to the people flying the ROVs and I uh, had to ID everything and I had to write the reports and do all the sciencey bits and uh i they always flew past the things i wanted to see <laughs> <laughs> i know I, the feeling uh, yeah exactly right <laughs> yeah, exactly so i was like hey you know like 
give me a shot. <laughs> and that. so they're like, yeah. So I started doing that and um, I got just fully hooked into the technology and that's all I wanted to do. Like I just wanted to fly the ROV. And of course, as everybody knows, when you fly ROVs in the ocean, they break and you have to figure out how to fix them. And I knew absolutely nothing. And I guess looking back onto it then, the people that I work with that had the RV knew not a lot more than I did at that time, which was mostly nothing. And so I just kind of took it upon myself to um, to try and figure out the technology and understand that side of it because I had, and I was super interested because I knew nothing about it and um, I just was learning every day. And I got to know people on Vancouver Island who operated these types of systems, uh, which is a pretty really small group of people at that time. And just kind of got hooked into the network and that's kind of what I did that for quite a few years and I started just run the ROV around more than I was diving. Um, and got ended up getting just like tons of hours flying these little ROVs around. Uh, got a, then started getting introductions into navigation because of course I was like, this is great, I can ID this thing now, where the heck are we? So I started to get into USBL stuff and got intrigued in that and started to try and understand how that worked. Um, I won't get into the logging thing because it's too long, but I, I got into other industries that use ROVs. <laughs> This is my favorite part. Yeah. So I keep going. short, we've, we've the short version, <laughs> yeah, short version is, I got hired as a con after like many, uh, probably five years or so of like being a biologist and flying RVs around, um, and getting a lot of hours. I got hooked into this really the guy who was really my first real ROV tech mentor who taught me like the foundation of pretty much everything I know about ROVs. Um, asked me to come and work with this group who was who was logging standing forests and lake in reservoirs that have been flooded so basically a reservoir is wow. created by a dam and they would flood it and the forest the standing forest would get flooded so you'd have this underwater standing forest <laughs> and they wanted to go reclaim a lot of that wood because it was taken out of the resource anyway it was underwater so it was like actually quite well preserved especially cedar and um and they wanted to go reclaim so they built this like combination of an rov and a fellow buncher and uh, I so went amazing. and uh, yeah, <laughs> so I went on contract for two weeks to go and and fly this thing. It was like right at the sort of point where they had kind of redeveloped the prototype and they were ready to try and like convert it into something like more commercial. And I came in and it just kind of like, I don't know why, I can't really explain it, it just sort of clicked. Like I just knew what I was doing somehow. And I think it's because I tree planted for a lot of years, growing like through high school, through Silent High School, through university, kind of paved my way through university planting trees. And it was like doing it in reverse. So I kind of understood <laughs> like the, the concept of like the tether. Cause like you can imagine trying to fly an ROV through a tether through a forest. It doesn't really work so well. <laughs> so you have to do it in a like a pattern. And I just kind of clicked with me and I was really good at it like almost right away. Like after I was there for two weeks, I was able to cut more trees in a day than anyone ever had before. Anyway, so a week later, I left after that contract. A week later, they hired me back and I stayed there for five years and I became the base. I ran this, the whole ROV side. Uh, I trained a ton of people um, and I developed a training program um, through with that group and I totally dove into like all the technology. So I got to learn about hydraulics and electronics and USBL and uh, coding. And um, we eventually rebuilt. We, I was, I was there for five years and it, um, and we built three vehicles during that time. So I got to be involved in like the build process and I just learned so much in that five years. It was crazy. Um, yeah. So that was like my real dive into the tech side and then running crews and teaching people how to fly ROVs and, and then, uh, yeah, just kind of kept going. I, so yeah, I was like, I've probably cut more trees underwater than any person. <laughs> <laughs> I think I calculated, I've cut about 10,000 trees. Wow. Underwater. That's crazy. That's, yeah. And, and I did it in, uh, the one real challenging part, which kind of got me into all like logistics and project planning, is actually we took the operation to Malaysia. Oh, and wow. I've um, worked in Malaysia for about a year and set up a operation uh, out there. And it's like super remote, like jungle area and a reservoir, like in the middle of the jungle. It was pretty wild. 
What happens to the trees when they're cut? Do they fall or float? Uh, it depends on the species, but they mostly fall. So the, mach the machine had a, um, a racking system, not actually not unlike what the little, uh, the little one we have on Herc, where it like spins the jars around and around. So this one was the rack was the whole size of the vehicle. And it could hold 50 airbags that were folded up on a cartridge. And so you would, you would had big grapples on the front. You'd grab, see, this is what happens. <laughs> so this you is great. No, I'm loving this. <laughs> you, you grapple the tree, like you find your tree and you get in the right spot and then you grapple the tree and that like rocks the vehicle to the tree and then you rack these airbags in place and then it puts it onto a little shuttle, hydraulically pushes it out against the tree and then there's like a drill bit in behind it and you literally lag bolt the airbag to the tree and then there's, it's shallow, it's like right? Goldberg logging. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, we got PL we did a whole we I revamped know. the whole PLC thing. We had it down this automated. Anyway. I love it. Um and then there was it's shallow, so you can run our, the core of our tether was an airline. And so we'd run compressed air down from the barge and it would blow up the airbag. So that would give it about I can't remember the number. Three hundred pounds or eight hundred I can't remember the number. Anyway, I'd give it buoyancy and then you and it would cut below that. At a forty-five inch, uh, three quarter, forty-five inch long, three-quarter inch chain, chainsaw, big hydraulic, like <laughs> it was, wow. it was awesome. <laughs> that was my favorite part. Wow. And, uh, and I it would know. <laughs> cut the tree in like one go, I and it would float up to the like surface. Multiple times, yeah. and I enjoy it every time. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so. <laughs> Sounds cool. Yeah. Was there is there a recorded video of it? Uh, yeah. I'd love to see we, it. So, the, uh, this is a funny twist. So, we, we got a, because it was a reclaimed product, we uh -huh. really marketed that, you know? So, we were marketing, does we, we would actually make our own products. So, we had value added wood products with a reclaimed wood product that wasn't cut from a forest, right? Because these, these, the trees in BC, they're underwater for 85 years. Wow. Something like that. And, so we, our big breakthrough, marketing-wise, was we were on the Martha Stewart show. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Oh. And after that, man, it, it took off. We were in, like, media. You, we so were you in, were on the Martha Stewart show. I was actually, I would just predated me. I didn't actually get to meet uh, Martha Stewart, but <laughs> um, it kind of took off from there. And then we were on all kind of, like, we were a Discovery Channel. We did those, like, crazy, like, mean machine, like, things. And then we did, like, so much media. It was... Like Wired magazine and uh, some of the techie techie stuff. Yeah. And what was what was the uh, diameter of these some of these trees? The biggest tree I ever cut was a fir tree, and it was 54 inches across okay. the. Wow. <laughs> wow. It was. I have a picture of me because I cut I cut the tree and we got to the surface and recovered it, and then I went down like a little bit lower and I cut what's called a dime. So I cut a slab that was about that thick and the whole thickness. And then I, brought, I actually was able to pick it up with the grapples, brought it back to our barge and got it onto the barge. And I have a picture of me laying down on it, <laughs> across it. <laughs> yeah. I don't know where that picture is. but That's the shot they shared on Martha Stewart show, right? Four feet. Yeah, that was way after Martha Stewart. Four that was right feet. near the end before I left, actually. But anyway, I left and I got into it because I had known so many people in Vancouver around that way. And then I started contracting to Ropos, which is a Canadian scientific submersible facility, uh, oh. which is a science sub um, out there. And they're awesome. A bunch of good people there and super smart and great ROV, great system. Um, they're still running all over the place. I think they're in Mauritius or Indian Ocean somewhere right now. What kinds of products did you make with or could you could be made with the, pr with the material you produce? So depending what you wanted to do, if you wanted to go through the process of like kiln drying it, because the wood is obviously super right. waterlogged, um, you'd have to kiln dry it and then you could make whatever you want. Um, but actually one of the things that was really great, the two things that were great were laminate, because it would peel. The first thing you do to a piece of wood, if you cut a log down in the forest, is you soak it in water to before you peel it to make like a laminate. So these you could peel immediately. You didn't have to go through that process. So that was actually good. And the other thing was musical instruments because you didn't have to soak them. They, they would bend very easily without checking. So you, we got in, we would sell a lot of our wood to people who made like violins and guitars and things like that. Huh. Yeah. 
I've got some wood down in the wet lab uh, from the <laughs> other day. Any use of that? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> that wasn't my big thing. But I do have, like, I have a couple, uh, my wood, si <laughs> this, this, my side tables in my bedroom are from trees that I cut. Huh. Oh, that's cool. That's cool. Yeah. Can make trying a little, to find a, a use for that. Violin. <laughs> <laughs> trying to find a use for that. Um, wood, it's, it's still pretty solid. Uh, it only had three three worms in it. Um, oh, wow. Bivalves, yeah, the, the wood chipworms. Um, so it's pretty solid wood still. Anyway, I would suggest if you want to get RVs, you go to engineering school. <laughs> <laughs> Don't take the path that I took because it's long and involved. And yeah, I would also not uh, <laughs> recommend going to school for geography if you want to <laughs> do ROVs. I would recommend going yeah. to engineering school. The cool thing about it is you go, if you're in if you're an engineer and you're going to school and you're doing the discipline that you like, it most likely translates into ROVs somewhere. And so bring those skills to the RV team and then you get to learn about what everyone else is really good at too. And so it's a neat place to uh, learn about all many different disciplines. So it's pretty cool that way. Yeah, those are great stories though. It didn't come from engineering, so. Yeah. There are as many stories as there are um, people on the ROV team, for sure. <laughs> Still looking for that pathway where you have a inordinate, like, useless knowledge of species, names, and Latin. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let me know if you... Well, it sounds like... Because I took the quiz, right? I took the Nautilus quiz, right? And they put me as ROV team. Did they really? Oh, perfect. Yeah. There you go. I haven't taken that yet. I should do that. I didn't know there was a... Yeah, there's a quiz. You've got a quiz on nautiluslive.org. And it assigns you what role you would be best in. Oh, that's great. I love that you were an ROV pilot. That's, that's so great. Cool. Yeah, still waiting for my big break, though. <laughs> oh, well, okay. I did, I did get a chance to intern last year. Uh, I got to clean out the Argus bottle. Salt and, salt and aluminum. Oxides, yeah. That's where you start, right? Yeah, cleaning. So, yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, that's where we all start. <laughs> that's where a lot of us still are. <laughs> <laughs> Bees, like all of us, actually. It's still mostly cleaning. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't change. You clean up dirty stuff. You can wrench and get dirty and want to learn stuff that you don't know how to do. Then you're an ROV pilot. <laughs> You keep a logbook of how many hours you clean to get to the, <laughs> the big time. That's uh, yeah, it's right in there with how many hours I pilot. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait, you're muted. Sorry, muted. I was trying to make a joke, which anyway, probably is not that. Funny. <laughs> now we want to hear it. I was saying that uh, my title is RV operations manager, but I think the first descriptor in that job is janitor. <laughs> just clean up stuff of yeah, various he's, various he's told things, me that before <laughs> whether it's physical or otherwise yeah <laughs> josh and gabby you people have asked this actually um do you have a wish list of something you would want in terms of operations that you would want on hercules or argus for that matter um not necessarily data collection wise, but like, what would you add to Hercules to make it better? Good question. I would add an inertial navigation system. Mm, I would add, like a I would make the, <laughs> mine's, mine's lame. Um, I would really love it if the aft camera was a pan and tilt. Mm. I think that would be amazing. I've seen it done, it is awesome. We did have the, you know, the wide eye camera we have. Yeah. We have a the super, super wide eye. eye yeah. We actually put that back there one time. Uh huh. It sees so much that yeah. you see nothing. It's <laughs> for um. Like it's too yeah. Much. Oh it's yeah, too it's much. too much. That's why, like, if you do like the medium wide eye, but have it on a pan and tilt, it's like good for the when you're yeah. in with all the spires and stuff. Oh uh, yeah. And you're like, oh, I just want to check my like port quarter. Like, I think yeah, I saw a spire over there. That's what like, Argus is for. I mean, you've got yeah, you've got totally. the best back view camera. Totally there but yeah, yeah I, I really like i saw it once and i'm like i really love this 
I posed this question to my watch on the last cruise. I said, if you had $10 million, oh, what that's kind of not a $10 million upgrade. No, no, no. But no, the first thing they said was inertial navigation. Was it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. Awesome. So I guess I have some influence there. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's not that far away, right? Like a fins? No, it's not. If we had a little bit newer octans, we could probably yeah. do that already. But ours is a little bit um, outdated. There's, there's always, I mean, the things with our visas, there's, there's always new things coming out and it's, uh, it's challenging to keep up. You know, it's, you want to go into operations and run your sub and, um, you know, you can't always be having in the shop replacing things or buying new stuff. And yeah. It's hard to do constant upgrades. Yeah. Every time you do that, like things get difficult, things don't work initially. When you change things, you often create problems that you weren't thinking you were going to create. And, uh, so oftentimes you stick with things that, you know, work. Mm -hmm. Let's see. I don't know, from your guys' perspective, what would you change? What would you add? Hey, quick question. Sorry to jump in here. Um, just wondering, pilots, if you guys could help me. We want to uh, land actually one kilometer, uh, 950 me meters north of where we are. Sure. Let's see. We are. Let's go. We can do it. We can. Yeah, we're only 2,000 meters down. That shouldn't be an issue. Okay. I'll make the move. Um, it's okay if I just do the ship at one knot, one and a half sure. knots. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Stuff your sorry's in a sec. <laughs> Bridge, Nav. Can we move eight hundred and seventy five meters bearing three six zero due north? Negative. Um, please move 875 meters, bearing 360. <laughs> yes, due north, uh, 360. Um, and we can go 1.5 knots. Okay, hey Steve, I've got a question sure. that I'm going to give to you because you're our watch lead and I know you have things you're specifically hoping to see often on these. So what kind of creatures do you hope to find today? This is a question from Lincoln, who's four years old, listening in. Okay, um, so when we get down to the seafloor, we're probably going to see, um, probably going to end up seeing a lot of sediment and maybe some hard rocky substrate, like rocky bottom um, boulders, cobbles, and things. Um, it's it's really we probably won't see a lot of life uh, in the beginning. Uh, things will be pretty sparse, but uh, I suspect as we move up slope, we'll start to see lots of more corals and sponges. Probably sponges first. Um, I'm hoping to see um, when we get to the top of the seamount some pretty spectacular high density. Uh, coral and sponge communities, lots and lots of corals and sponges and all their associate organisms like sea stars and brittle stars, fishes. Um, but I think it's going to take some time to get up there. We're not going to see all that instantaneously. It's going to be a gradual process. Um, so one of the things I'm most interested in are, are the where uh, in depth and where on the seamount these transitions happen from one community to the next. 
So I, I'm very curious to see how, uh, how, where those are and what the summit community is going to be like. It's kind of a slow reveal as we bag these deep sea peaks, you know? <laughs> <laughs> That's Lincoln, what we do. Yeah. Lincoln was also wondering if we think we'll see any whales. And we never know. Uh, a few days ago when we put Hercules into the water, uh, we had a pilot whale that was swimming by. Um, so we never know when we're exploring what we're going to see. That's kind of the fun of it. Um, a few years back, a sperm whale came up and explored ROV Hercules, so there's some really fun footage of that. Um, but we see all sorts of creatures out here. We've um, frequently, on these dives, as we've been putting in Hercules, um, either in the water or taking Hercules out, we've been seeing some sharks and mahi-mahi swimming around. So if you catch the earlier end parts of our dives, you may be able to see that. We've got some really great footage of these oceanic white tip sharks um, just a few hours ago when we were bringing the ROVs back on. And then these really beautiful mahi-mahi fish that are this vibrant blue and green color. Uh, so we may see those again if you keep your eyes open. But thanks, Lincoln, for the question. Yep. Could also see some evidence of whales like we did see in the last cruise. You oh, never right. know when you're going to see fossilized evidence. There was a really neat, um, the very last cruise, ROV cruise of last year, uh, we were diving off the Southern California borderlands and we came across what, what we thought was a fossilized, some sort of fossilized mammal of some type. There was a really cool photo um, in last year's oceanography supplement about it. Uh, you could see like bones coming out of the rock. Oh, cool! Uh, so it's probably something that was long, long there, long dead. There it is. Oh wow! I really didn't see that. Fossilized really marine cool. mammal. Yeah. You can see the whole rib cage there. Wow, that's interesting. I'm always hoping we see whales. <laughs> Yeah, this was really unusual. I didn't know the Southern California borderlands were so dynamic, but it was really fascinating. Mm -hmm. I imagine there's lots of tectonic activity there and things get disrupted after a while and you probably get things that are exposed. So this might be one of those things. Because it's very unusual setting it right on top of the surface like that. Yeah, wow. That's on page 39. question about that whale false fossil um if we were able to would we recover things like that do we recover fossils uh we were in a protected area when we saw that but generally as long as it's not a marine mammal it's okay uh however marine mammals and uh, products of marine mammals are specifically regulated by the marine mammals protection act mm -hmm. so uh, you have to get special permits for that. Uh, we did get those permits with our help from some partners at the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary last year to collect some whale bones from a, a whale fall out on Davidson Seamount. We collected some some bones uh, that will go for research purposes, both to examine the Osidax worms, the worms that eat the bone material and the nutrients in the bones. Uh, as well as the bones themselves, which will go towards identifying that particular whale. Um, and then oh, those will go to Cal, Cal Academy, I think, okay. for that repository. It's a thousand, yeah, not super far. A little less than a thousand meters. Bridge, Nav. Uh, we're tracking more northwest rather than due north. Uh, perhaps change your heading. To the north. Yeah. That's what he's doing. He's pointing it towards the north, I believe. Yeah.
What are you gonna do? I have like my hand on my hip, <laughs> my finger right here, <laughs> ready. I had a question wondering what we do when we are not on watch. That is a great question. Kind of depends on the day. It kind of depends on the role of what you do on the ship. Um, I would say number one, people are trying to get some sleep if you can, because uh, our we've got two watches uh, a day. So this is our 12 to 4 watch. So we're on from midnight to 4 a.m. and then noon to 4 p.m. Um, but a lot of us have different tasks that we need to do uh, when we're not on watch. Um, so if we have brought ROVs back up after diving, we have our scientists who are working in the wet lab doing all that sampling work. Um, so Ashley, maybe you want to explain kind of what, what you do in those hours, because um, you got to have to do that whether you're on watch or not. We kind of have to do that right after we bring the ROVs up. Very true. Yeah, it's very important that we get all the samples off the ROV um, so the ROV team can prepare it for the next dive, but also so that we are making sure we're getting the samples in the best possible condition. Um, so we'll bring them into the wet lab, preserve them in ethanol alcohol, and um, package them and label them and ship them off to whatever universities or institutions need 